Let me click the button. It doesn't have the option on my side. I am recording. Okay. Okay, so if we go here, uh, you probably got this pop up by the way when you open LBOS. It says there's no dealer information file in there. Uh, do you want to fill it in? You might as well say yes so it stops bugging you. All that is is it's asking you the name of your dealership. So, uh, Audio Vision uh, Inc. Uh, and then your support email address. And all that does is when you go in the help menu about, uh, you see your company information in there so the guy knows where to call. Anyway, uh, I digress. Uh, if we go in maintenance, the transaction completion deal, uh, we could put a PID number on the item. Okay. And then say uh, two, uh, sorry, three items in PID one, two, three that you put on the item. And then when you have three items, you give uh, a dollar figure equivalent to your, uh, to the price of one item. And that becomes a, a buy two, get one free. Buy three, get one free, sorry. And you could call that deal buy three, get one free. And it would show up properly on the receipt. That's one way to achieve it. And another way would be create a coupon item, flag it as store coupon, and make the price the exact same as the item you want to give uh, buy two, get one free. And then on the ECL tab, add a ITM record uh, pointing to whatever item you want to give and say, I need a quantity of three. That would trigger this coupon item uh, when you buy three of this item here. So that's another way of doing it. So uh, I think we'll get started. It's 1.05, so uh, the late people can join in later. Um, so today what we're going to be seeing is the uh, purchase orders and uh, the receivings and uh, stock management, along with cost information. We already saw in maintenance um, all these tabs and the prices and the promotions and all that. Uh, I've been screwing around a lot in my database, so let me just reload the sample item database just so I'm back to uh, default. Um, so you guys see the same thing I do. You want to reload the sample database uh, here in the file menu configuration. There is a load files tab. The upper part is just a history. You can't do anything in there. And then at the bottom, you got screen layouts that you can reload. You know, you got prompted for that at install time. Uh, well, you can reload different ones from here. Uh, and then the sample database for uh, for the items in the sub department is right here. So you can just highlight sample, click load, and then you're back. Uh, then you're back with the uh, Oreo cookies and the grocery departments and uh, everything that's in there by default. Be careful with that, though, because it doesn't uh, append your database. It overwrites it, so you're back to default. I just realized I forgot to give you guys access to the record button. So let me give you guys organizer status so you can record it. Sorry about that. Okay, now you guys are all organizers. Uh, you should have access to your uh, your record button now. <clears throat> so I am back to the default Oreo cookies sample database. 
Uh, so let's see how the cost information and the vendors work, and then we'll go do inventory. So if I create a brand new item, let's create item uh, one, two, three, four, five, enter. I'm gonna create a new one. I'm gonna call that a test item in sub department, uh, whatever, grocery, $1.99. So I have this sample test item. When I go in the cost tab, um, there's no uh, there's no way to input anything except a vendor. You can double click in the vendor number field, or you can click the plus sign. That does the same thing. Uh, is the first step you need to do before you can input cost information because you can have more than one vendor uh, for the same item, and they might have different costs. So uh, the cost is associated to a vendor, so you need to add it first. So this test item, I'm going to double click here and say uh, this is carried by uh, vendor uh, vendor one there. I'm going to use it, and then I am able to click in there and type in some information. Now that list of vendors, it comes from another table that we saw briefly on uh, Wednesday or Tuesday, I can't remember. Uh, so PLU menu, vendor table. This is where you create all your, um, all your different uh, vendors you're gonna be purchasing from. Uh, the vendor number, you make it up, you type it. Then you got his address information and uh, email and phone number. And you also have this account number field here is your account number at the vendors uh, where they bill you. So this will print on uh, the purchase orders and on a few uh, different reports. You, it's not compulsory, but if you have an account number, you can type it in there. There is also the possibility of multiple regions for the same vendor so that if you have stores spanned across different provinces or states, they can have different costs, you know, more, uh, more expensive taxes or transport fees or whatever. Uh, let's stick to just a common region for now, and then I'll give a multi-store class uh, in a few weeks and we can uh, start talking about price zones and cost zones. So you go in there, you create all your vendors. Once you are satisfied that your information is in there, you can go assign it to your items. And uh, this is where you would type the vendor SKU number. You know, they have an, uh, their own item list and their item numbers are often different than the barcode on the product. So it's their internal item number. You can type that in there. It's alphanumeric, so I can go A, B, C, one, two, three. It accepts dashes and all that stuff too. Uh, and then when you purchase a product, it's often by case. It's re pretty rare that you can buy it as a unit. If you do, you can just put a one in there, but you need to put a case quantity, let's say it's a case of 12, with a cost for that case. So that's a $20 case of test items. Notice here at the bottom, my unit cost, is 167 because 20 divided by 12 makes 167 unit cost. If I go back on my price tab, my um, price is 199. So my current margin is showing 1625 because my unit cost is 167. <coughs> You can have more than one vendor on the same product. I can add another one here and go add, uh, let's say vendor 102 Hitchcock Foods. We're gonna create a new vendor for it. And his uh, item code is uh, XYZ456. The case is a case of 12 still, but he sells it a bit more expensive, it's 21.95. So my unit cost is 183 on that one, not 167. Let me just make the rest of the people organizers here. Hold on. Oh yeah. <clears throat> 
So I have two vendors now, vendor one, 12 for 20 bucks, and vendor 102, 12 for 21.95. So that one's more expensive. We are going to set the default vendor to the cheapest one. See here it's pointing default vendor is one because this is the cheapest one. This is the one I'm gonna order to uh, from by default. Um, the uh, cost of the product can get updated during a, uh, uh, a receiving of products. And every time you change the cost during a receiving, we will update the landed unit cost and make an average of everything you received. We'll see that uh, in about maybe 20 minutes. But right now, my landed unit cost says zero because I never um, received that item. I can force the current unit cost to be the landed cost by clicking the use button here. If I click use, um, it updates my. Uh, my landed cost. <clears throat> Otherwise, oops, I picked the wrong product. Um, otherwise, I need to do some receivings in order for that landed cost to be uh, to be used. I can also set some cost breaks. Uh, they're kind of like promotions, kind of like the batches we do for prices, but that is for cost. So the way this works, it is per vendor. I can put cost breaks on a vendor and then go to the next one and there's no cost break. Okay, and this is a per vendor setting. So we're going to go here and add a new cost break. And it prompts me with a calendar and a quantity. So I can tell it, uh, let's say for the month of March, there's a promotion. So from March 1st, if I buy a quantity of uh, 10 cases all the way till March 31st, I'm going to get a uh, 15% discount. Then I'm going to add another cost break. Same date, range March 1st, but a quantity of 25 this time, all the way to March 31st, and I'm going to give it a 30% uh, discount. So if I buy 10, I get 15%. My unit cost is going to fall to 142. And if I buy 25, my unit cost is going to fall to 117. I'm going to even create another one just for the sake of it. March 1st, quantity, and if I buy 45. So March 31st, I'm going to get 50% discount. 83 cents a unit. So that's how our cost breaks works. I'm going to demonstrate them in a few minutes when we go see the, the purchase orders and the, the receiving and all that stuff. <coughs> um, any questions so far? No, we're good. So, um, before we can go look at purchase orders and stock counts and receivings, there is this inventory tab here where you need to turn on this little flag, inventory tracking, in order to be able to call that product in the purchase order and receiving module. If you don't turn that flag on, it means to LBOSS, I don't want to track the inventory of this item, I don't care. So it doesn't show up in that uh, in the inventory module. So that's always the first step, inventory tab. And we can set some minimums and some reorder quantities and all that stuff, but I will show you that uh, in a few minutes when we see the purchase orders. I'll leave it blank for now and just tell it, track the inventory. Sometimes you have two products that you want to deduct the same on hand. Uh, cigarette packs and cigarette cartons is a, is a very uh, common example of that. Um, so what you can do is turn on this flag instead. Let's call this item a cigarette pack. 
And let's take the next item, one, two, three, four, or five, six. And this is going to be a cigarette carton. Make that one uh, 55 bucks. Sub department, whatever. And in inventory of that one, I am not going to turn on the inventory flag. I'm going to turn on the inventory child parent flag. If I click this one, it says you can't have parent child at the same time. It's been turned off. They're mutually exclusive. If I click the other one, it says you can't track inventory if you're a child. So it's either one or the other. When you turn on child parent, you need to tell it which item is the parent. So this is a carton. I'm going to point it to this item here, one, two, three, four, five, which is my pack. So carton is child parent of one, two, three, four, five pack for a quantity of 10 packs in a carton. So what this means here is whenever I sell a carton, at the point of sale or receive a carton in the back office it is going to deduct the on hand of this parent product instead by the specified quantity so i sell one carton it deducts 10 on hand of the parent which is the pack <clears throat> nothing confusing to so far So let's go do some inventory transactions. Let's take, uh, let's go in the uh, inventory module and start with a purchase order. To do so, you can access it through this button here, inventory, on the main LBOSS window. And then this is what you can do in there. You can do a purchase order. You can do a stock count, which will overwrite your current value. You can receive some purchase orders or receive from scratch. You can do some stock adjustments for spoilage and theft and all that. And if you're in a multi-store environment, you can transfer to another store or receive from another store. So let's start by the basic, a purchase order. Uh, you'll notice the same three icons under every operation. The uh, eye icon is just to view the orders that are currently posted in the system, the history of what got posted. If I go in there, there's nothing. It's all blank. I didn't do anything yet. Same for stock counts, same for receivings. They're all blank. Uh, I did not uh, do any transactions yet. The plus sign is to create a new one. And this hourglass thingy uh, is to continue one if you were in the middle of an order or a stock count and you got interrupted you had to save the session to come back to it later you didn't post it yet well when you want to come back to it later it's going to show up in this list here which is currently playing so what we want to do is create a new purchase order so let's do so plus sign here and then the first thing it asks you is okay which vendor do you want to purchase from uh, you know where that list comes from. We just saw it in maintenance vendor table. So let's do a purchase order for vendor one. Uh, it asks me if I want to put in a PO number. So I can leave it blank or I can put one. Uh, I'll click, uh, I can type what I want or I can click on generate, which will generate a unique number for me. So here's my unique number. And I will add to that uh, slash uh, AD. So here's my purchase order window. In there, I can scan or I can type or I can double click to get a list um, in both UPC code or in vendor's queue number. All the items for that vendor that have a SKU number will show up in that list. <clears throat> Most people will scan in there, but some people still do it manually by typing or by double-clicking. 
Um, so let's start receiving some products. Double click here. I'm going to get some Oreo cookies. I want uh, three cases. Some soda biscuits. I want one case of that. I can go by case or by unit. Both of them work. Okay. Um, all right, now both of these, the case size is one, so that's not very uh, specific, but let's take another product. That one has a case size of 12, so let's take two cases. You can see my total units is 24 because two cases is a case size of 12, so it receives a number of units. These two, case size of one, so whatever I type in case is the same thing in units. Or I can specify, all right, I want five units for that one instead. Or a combination of both. So these two columns will sum up in the total units. And this is what you're going to be ordering. I can add a manual discount amount. It will show up in my reports. Um, let's skip that for now. I'll show you in a minute. So my product here one, two, three, four, five, I created some cost breaks. By the way, uh, maintenance, if you scroll your items here, if I move that out of the way. If you scroll through your items, the maintenance screen is linked to your items in the, in the receiving window whenever you highlight them. So that's always useful for, uh, for maintenance. A lot of people have a dual screen set up now, so they put maintenance in one screen and the purchase order in the other. And then they're able to go back and forth between it. So this product, one, two, three, four, five, has some cost breaks. We set a quantity of 10, 25, and 45 with different discount amounts uh, if I purchase it from the 1st to the 31st of March. So we'll go in here and I'm going to raise my quantity of cases. Because I told it, if I buy 25 cases, I get 30%. So let's put 30 cases. So this amount here is reflected um, uh, the cost breaks because of the quantity that I, uh, that I put. So I can add as many products as I want to that list. I can type in the remark. Uh, this is the remark, blah, blah, blah. And when I'm ready, I can post that in the system. Takes a few minutes to post, but a few seconds, but eventually you're gonna get a pop-up report. And here it is. So here's my purchase order. I've got my store shipping address, um, the account number that I showed you in the vendor table. Remember that? Here in vendor, you could put your own account number at that vendor. It will print on the purchase order. Uh, your remark, your PO number, etc. So here's my product, and then there's a total amount at the bottom, total quantity, uh, and uh, cost break is reflected here. <clears throat> so that's a simple purchase order. If I go back to inventory now, now the little eye icon of the purchase order shows me something in the list and I can go back in there, I can double click and it shows me that purchase order. It's, it's all grayed out. You can't modify it anymore because it's been posted, but you can look at it and you can reprint uh, your report. So that's a simple purchase order. Um, we also have the capability in that, uh, in that table to put some minimum unit quantity. Okay, let me take another item, this one. And let's say this one needs a minimum of 30 on hand. 
currently it has hmm, negative 18 okay whatever so it has negative 18 right now and i told it to keep a minimum of 30. if it falls under 30 we are telling here reorder me one case uh you got to be uh, paying attention because this is in units minimum unit quantity and this reorder quantity is in cases so that confuses a lot of people um this item i'm going to put a 12 in a case or uh 11 22 there so i told it minimum 30 on hand otherwise reorder me let's put uh, something more significant let's put four cases So you can go through all your items and tell them to keep a minimum of X and reorder a quantity of X in here. If I go in my inventory tab now and do another purchase order, uh, what vendor was that guy? Hold on, that was vendor one, okay. So another purchase order for vendor one, another PO number, we're gonna generate one. And here we can go commands auto generate order based off minimum so what that will do is it'll take it'll scan your whole database all the items carried by vendor one because that's the one I selected and scan for all the ones that are under their current minimum and reorder the specified quantity if I click on that I'm gonna see a few products populated now and here's my IGA salad dressing. I have minus 18 on hand and I told it to keep 30. If it falls under 30, it should reorder me four cases. Which it did. Did it not? Hmm. Something's wrong here. Let's delete that and start over. Bear with me a second. Let me just check if I have something wrong in my tables. I think I know what's wrong. No. Okay, I believe I got it. Hold on. So right now I have three on hand, minimum of 30. Reorder me four cases. Let's try this again.
inventory, purchase order, new one, vendor one, PO number, and then auto generate from minimum. Everything is zero. Well, give me one second, guys. I'm going to go pick at my supports brain real quick. I'll be right back. Hold on. Okay, sorry guys, apparently uh, there's something I need to fix in my advanced flag, so let me go do just that real quick. So what am I looking for? Order. Order. Mm -hmm. Case rounding factor. I should put that to zero or what? Hmm? Okay, thank you. So I apologize guys about the confusion. Um, it has to do with the rounding factor of your cases. I'm asking for a quantity that is um, a quantity here that doesn't compute with my number of cases. So I just bypass that by setting a different rounding factor. I don't want to confuse you. When you need to do it, uh, give our support team a trial and they'll uh, tell you what to do. So if I do this now, it should work. Inventory, order, vendor one, auto generate off minimum. And it is still not working. I just love when that happens when a demo, during a demo. Well, tell you what, guys, I have a problem. I'll figure it out and let you know what I did wrong. But uh, normally, you should see the specified number of units being reordered. Um, I really apologize that this is not working and I can't demonstrate, but I will figure it out and let you know by email what I did wrong. I can see that it's picking up, picking up the right items. It's just not putting any quantities for some reason. But pretend that it is. <laughs> Uh, if I close the window now, I can click on continue later. If I click on that, I get a little number next to my hourglass. That means I have open sessions that I didn't publish yet, I didn't post. Um, if I click on that, here are the two sessions that I created with the items in there. I just didn't post them yet. I could continue adding to that. And when I'm ready, uh, click post. This happens if I get interrupted by an employee 
I go help him out for a few minutes and come back to it. I have to close the window. I go continue wait later and I can come back to it and finish it. So that's one way of doing automatic orders uh, based off minimums. Uh, I am not sure why it's not working, but I will figure it out and let you know. Uh, I've used this multiple times and I know it's not that. It's not a known issue, so it has to be something with my setup. I'm going to create another purchase order again, but this time we're going to go auto generate from the sales. And instead of from minimum on hand, it's from sales. If I click on that, I get prompted with a date range, and I can say, give me everything I sold for that vendor uh, between March 1st and today. March 1st and today. Uh, I can multiply that by a factor of whatever. Right now I'm going to keep it as a factor of 1, but I could have it multiply or divide by a factor, by 1.5 or 0 0.5, whatever. And I have the choice between total sales or average sales. Total sales will be um, the exact quantity picked up for every item during that date range. Average sales will be the average quantity per day for the period multiplied by the number of days. So if I go total sales, click OK. Um, I have a bunch of items here that got picked up. So these are all the items that were sold by that vendor. And for some reason, it's also all zero. So I really do have a, an issue with my uh, LBOS. Um, but I don't want to lose too much time. So we'll just manually input some, uh, some numbers here. <clears throat> and this is to generate based off your, uh, your sales rather than on minimum levels. We're going to post that. Close that. Uh, and look here, my receivings. They now have a three next to the plus sign to create new receivings. That means when I click on that, on that to, to receive my stock, you know, it's a few days later, the, the truck just came in with the pallets. I need to unload that, so receiving. I can receive manually without having ordered, just, you know, just to input some receiving quantities, or I can receive from an open order. If I click receive from an order, I get the list of all the ones that I posted earlier, and you can see uh, one of them I put in a remark, and it shows up in here. Also have my PO numbers. So I'm going to take this guy, enter the invoice number. That would be your invoice number at the vendors for just receiving. So this is invoice uh, INV345. Uh, and here is my purchase order that I ordered earlier. You can just do a quick validation and post as is, or you can change some stuff in there. Uh, I ordered... Uh, I, I ordered uh, 30 units of the cigarette pack, but they ran out. They only sent me uh, 23. So I'm changing my quantity here. And then uh, the salad, uh, salad dressing is supposed to be 122 each, but they raised the price on me. So I'm going to change that to $1.39 uh, each. See, when I hit enter, it says, hey, you just changed the cost on this item. Do you want to update your back office? So did I update that cost permanently or was that just a one-time thing? So if it's permanent, you say yes. And if I go on that item in LBOS now, My cost is updated to $1.39 right away. I don't need to go change it. It's done from the purchase order, uh, from the receipt. Notice something, though. My landed unit cost is different now, $1.33. That's because I did another purchase order uh, earlier with 
uh, a cheaper price and now I'm receiving some new ones with a higher price. So it's doing an average of the landed unit cost. It's gonna re-average it every time you do a receiving. If I do a receiving of uh, 30 uh, units at 10 cents, is going to fall at about uh, probably 70 something cents the uh, landed unit cost. <clears throat> so, very simple, not much in there. You do a purchase order of your quantities and you receive that order. Um, during the receiving process, when you post that, it's going to print the same report that you saw as the purchase order. And I also changed the quantity on one of them. So it's going to prompt me. Um, it's going to tell me at some point when I close this window, do you want to keep a back order of your missing units? So I am going to close this receiving window. And from here, I can print shelf labels and item labels. Shelf labels here. I have the choice of uh, different label pipes, depending on what items I uh, selected in my transaction. And when I print that label, it shows me all the items that I just received. There's supposed to be a barcode on there, but I did not install the barcode fonts on this computer. This is why you don't see the barcode under the description, but normally there is one. And I probably have an urgent message right now telling me Hey, barcode fonts are not installed. So don't worry about it. Just pretend you saw a barcode on there. So shelf label is one for the shelf. Item label is the same label, type C, but it's going to be not one example for each item, but it's going to be one for each quantity received. When I finally close that report and label window, it's telling me here, hey, do you want to keep the non-received items in order? If you recall, I changed the quantity on one of the items. I was supposed to receive 30, but I received 23. So if I click yes on the back order prompt, it reopens the order window with the item quantities um, that are in back order. So that missing seven packs that I changed is there, and I can post it. So that's how you do a purchase order and receive those purchase orders. It will only affect your on-hand levels uh, and quantities when you receive, ordering it doesn't do anything as far as uh, as on hand. It's just to place the order at the vendor and then to receive that order. Only when you receive it does it update your on hand. Uh, some areas might have some different uh, fees and charges during their purchase orders. I'm thinking of the Caribbean where they do a lot of uh, international shipping and ordering. Uh, they have duty, they have transport fees and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> we have a table in maintenance where you can set some additional uh, receiving charges or ordering charges. Right now I kept it as default, but you can also go here in the register menu, inventory charges, And in that uh, table, you have all the basic inventory operation, physical counts, stock adjustments, receivings, orderings, and transfers. Let's say during my receiving, I want to add some uh, transport uh, charges, some shipping fees, and some, uh, some taxes, you know, some duty. So we can click here on totalizers. And there is a preset list that we deliver by default, insurance, shipping, duty, but you can add to this list uh, by just creating new totalizers and giving them the name you want. Uh, this is a little bit advanced, but if you ever get to that point, I'll give you a crash course. It's, uh, it's easy to follow. <clears throat> so let's say I want to put some uh, shipping fees 
right here. And I want to put some uh, duties. And between the two, I want a subtotal line. So shipping, subtotal, and duties. Each of these operations can be an open amount, a preset amount, an open percent, or a preset percent. I will do a uh, open amount. Well, I will do a preset amount. Let's do uh, $25 of charge for each shipped um, thing. And then the duties, I will put a preset percent of 15%. Uh, so that's during a receiving process. I just created that those three lines. So if I go do a new receiving now after that, go inventory, receiving, uh, I can receive from an order. Here's my back order earlier, and here's a bunch of other stuff. You know what, let's do a receiving manual just to show you the difference. If I click on create receiving, this is without a vendor, without an order, not without a vendor, but without an order, you're just manually receiving some stuff. Uh, vendor one, invoice number, blah, blah, blah. And look here at the bottom right, these things that I added show up in there. Okay, I have my $25 of uh, shipping fees, a subtotal, and my duties. So if I go add my item, in my list. So I have one of these, one case of these, 15 units of these, and five cases of these. So I got my flat fee of 25 bucks for shipping and my 15% of duties based off that total line. And I got a subtotal between the two. But if I post this, it's gonna show up on the report as well and be total at the bottom. So it added some three additional lines at the bottom here with my total amount. And this was from the maintenance register inventory charges. You can control that for each of the different operations and have different charges and different things in there. Any questions? Everyone's following? For the for the auto order a minimum quantity, can that be automated? Can we set a task to just generate that PO? That is an excellent question. I will say probably, but I have to play around in there. That's the first time it's uh, been asked. Can you believe that? But it's a good idea, though. Um, I'd have to play around and get back to you, uh, Arif, but uh, I'm, I'm pretty confident that I can okay. do something like that. Um, so the two basic operations, order and receiving, you can also do some stock counts. That one, when you click the plus sign, it will not prompt you for a vendor because you're counting what's already in your store. You don't care which vendor it comes from. When you click it, it opens the window right away. And this is where you start counting. I have this item one, I have 10 of these. Item two, I have uh, four of these. Item three, I have five, and so on. When you post that, see that was the on hand before I counted. And these are the uh, new uh, on hands. When I click that, I am going to replace the current values in my on hands with those. This is what I counted. The counts can be done uh, during the store movement. We will we have a, a, an internal variable that takes a snapshot of what the on hand is as soon as you enter 
in the window, uh, you go and count. And as soon as I enter an item, let's say item 10, when I did that, at 1.52 p.m., there's an internal variable of there was nine on hand. So if you go um, two aisles down to count, and you take an hour to take that to, uh, to uh, count that aisle, and then you post that an hour later, it's going to know if you sold two at the registers in the meantime, it knows that there's sales and it had a snapshot of nine at the time that you entered it in that grid. So it's going to deduct those two automatically and post a seven instead for you. Okay. It is automatically uh, figuring out how much movement there is in real time while you count. So that's a huge advantage we have over the competition. Um, the competitors. <laughs> Our previous version had a, a manual option to do that, but it didn't work that well. It was called um, uh, as of midnight. Uh, but we completely changed that principle now. We're simply taking a snapshot of the on hand at the moment that you scan it in the grid. This way, if you take three hours to count when you post, is going to deduct whatever sales was for the item uh, was done between that time and the time you post. So this is to replace your existing on hand. Some stores will do that once every three years and be completely off, and some other stores are, have a super tight grip on it and do it on the first of every month. And ask for explanation of every variance. Um, it, it's, uh, you're going to encounter both types of, uh, of uh, administrations. And then adjustment is kind of like account in the sense that it doesn't prompt you for a vendor. You're adjusting what you have already in your store. So as soon as I click plus, I'm already in the window. But this one, as opposed to the count, instead of replacing your value, it will adjust your value and attend to it. So let's say uh, let's say an employee dropped a case of glass bottles and uh, you want to put spoilage in there. So you go UPC code uh, Coke cans and units uh, minus 12 because I just dropped a case of 12. And then my beer uh, or my uh, whatever, another product, uh, cream corn it went bad so i just wasted uh six cans for spoilage so minus six i can also positively adjust you know you found something in the parking lot or whatever you can put some positive adjustments but by default uh, most people use them as negatives and remark uh, spoilage So this, as opposed to the count, instead of replacing it, it will append to it and subtract. Um, Arif, if we go to the uh, count window, I'll show you the report. I realize I closed it pretty quickly. So let me go back in there and just reprint it. So to do so, click the I icon. You'll see the list of your stock counts. Let me take this one. And then we will reprint the report with this button here. And this is what it shows you. Which store you counted, what you counted, the average cost, and then what's the total value. What you are looking for is a separate report that we have here in the inventory category called count variance. If you take this one, you can double click to select one of those two counts that you just did. Preview, and you had, okay, what was calculated? What was it expecting before I posted? Here is what I posted, and here's the variance between the two. We have all sorts of other inventory movement reports. Uh, let's take uh, this one, for example. So between this day and this day, here's what you received, here's what got transferred, uh, adjusted, sold, and the total movement. 
So we got all sorts of report you can take for inventory, but in the count window, it just shows you what you posted. So not much to that inventory module. There's a few weird quirks uh, or weird, weird features like that duty and levy stuff and the, um, the automatically generate and parent child. Uh, but other than that, it's pretty straightforward. You place an order, you receive that order, and it affects your own hand. You post a count, it replaces. Um, I just realized I forgot to show you the parent child what happens when you scan such a product, either in an order or receiving or account. It does the same behavior. If I go here and I scan my product that was parent child, if you, re you recall a few minutes ago, this product, the cigarette carton, I turned the parent child flag on and not the inventory flag on, pointing to the pack one, two, three, four, five. So if I go in here and I try to scan that barcode of the carton, one, two, three, four, six, as soon as I scan it, it doesn't find it and it's not working. Great. Hold on. Might not be for that vendor. Oh, that's it. That's exactly what it is. There is no vendor for this product. Okay, let's try this again. So back in here, order, vendor one. I tried to scan my carton. And it says, instead of this UPC, I am bringing you the parent item instead. I scan one, two, three, four, six, but it's returning one, two, three, four, five, which is the, the parent that it's pointing to. And here's my pack. I'm tracking the on hand of the pack, not of the carton. So when I scan the carton, it brings the pack in the buffer. If I do a sale at the point of sale of the carton, it's going to deduct the on hand of the parent, the cigarette pack, by the specified quantity of 10. If I order the carton, it's going to put in the buffer my pack instead. <clears throat> and then Last but not least is the transfer and the receive transfer. I'm not going to get into those because they work exactly the same way as a purchase order or a receiving. They increment their own totals, but they affect the on hand the same way and they function the same way. You do a stock transfer. Okay, where are you transferring to? Right now, I only have one. So if I choose myself, it's going to say you can't transfer to yourself. But you choose which store you want to transfer from, uh, transfer to. It opens the window that looks identical to the order window. And then at that destination store, you're going to have a little one here where you can click the plus sign and receive that transfer the same way you would receive an order. If you notice, my items, I spoke about it briefly earlier. But I have a unit cost, a current cost of the item. And I have a landed unit cost, which this one gets updated and re-averaged every time you do a new receiving. So this is the current one, but I received one at $1.33, I think, and then I received another at $1.39 uh, with different quantities. So it averaged that to $1.37. This average landed cost is what is recorded at the time of the sale on most of the reports that show a profit margin or a cost column on there. It's going to use this one. Any questions on inventory? Uh, I'll do a quick Q&A period, but we covered most of it. Uh, 
Uh, we're going to have the system settings after the break, but uh, I can take a few minutes. We're about 10 minutes in advance, so I can take a few minutes to answer your questions if, uh, if anything was not clear. I do know that I go very fast, guys, and uh, I apologize that it's too much stuff in too little time. But if I do a class for three weeks, going into details of everything, uh, no one's going to attend. No one can get away from work for three weeks. So I, I have about 15 hours to jam everything into a class. So I apologize if it's going fast. I, uh, I am not expecting everyone to remember everything here. Just at least you're going to have the videos for reference. And you're going to have a better sense of familiarity when you call our support line for, for, for guidance. So any questions, don't hesitate. Um, one thing I forgot to mention, your items got vendor SKU numbers here. Okay, I can type... Uh, X, X, one, two, three, and whatever. Put some random uh, item codes. And then in here, I can search by item code. I can go uh, vendor code F5 and type X, X, one, two, three. And it brings me that product in the buffer. I can search by both. Same thing for doing a receiving or a purchase order. I'm able to scan the vendor SKU number. And at the limit, you can even turn on a little flag in the PLU button of the um, point of sale, and you're able to scan your SKU numbers at the point of sale as well. I forgot to mention that, but. <clears throat> okay, well, it is 2.05. Uh, let's take a little break. Let's be back at 2.20, 2.25. And then we will start the second little class, which is the POS system settings. That one will last about an hour. Um, I'm going to do an overview of the important stuff in there. The rest is uh, kind of superfluous. But we'll try to go through the important stuff, and then uh, we'll be done around uh, 3, 3.15. So see you guys in 15 minutes. We are back. Um, so I've got about an hour to go on the POS system settings now. Um, I'm going to skip some of the stuff in there because it's not really important. I'm going to cover the important stuff. Um, and again, don't hesitate to stop me if you have any questions. Um, so let's go through this. In the point of sale, anytime you want to go in uh, the configuration, whether it is for peripherals, uh, for system settings that we're about to see, uh, for advertisements, or for screen design, buttons and forms, anytime you go in there, um, you're actually going through the network, connecting to the back office database or INI files, and modifying it in there. And when you get out of the setup, it sends you back your changes. Um, the different options, uh, setup options, are available when you click on the word L pause here on the top left corner. You get a little drop down menu. Everything in there is grayed out unless you're logged on as your admin account level seven. Okay. And like I said, any place you click in there is going to go through the network. And it's going to connect to the back office database server. Anything you modify will be modified in the back office database and sent back to yourself as soon as you get out. Um, this is because by default, all the point of sale lanes have the same setup. They have the same screen, the same system settings, and we consider they have the same peripherals as well. So there's like one central configuration file that gets deployed to all the lanes. So if you go, for example, change a button, you go in buttons and forms and you remove this uh, grocery button and you put uh, whatever, a uh, list of account button instead, well, you're actually going through the network and modifying the back office files. It sends you back those changes to yourself when you get out 
and then all the other lanes in the store will get that change uh, on the next task, deploy all changes. Remember that, right? So deploy all changes or deploy and replace, whatever task will deploy. So you go in here, you go in buttons and forms or system, you change something, it affects the back office database, you get it back, and then the other lanes will get it back whenever deploy all changes is executed or deploy and replace. <clears throat> so um, I will log on as a level seven. My password. Um, so if I click on this drop down list now, it's no longer grayed out because I'm logged in as admin, so I'm able to go in the setup. So let's go here in system. This is where all the system settings are. Um, so the first tab in there, general settings. Not a whole lot, your store address information. Um, the two things you're gonna play with in there is most likely cache and drawer limits and maybe poll messages if you have a poll display rather than a second customer mod. Those are getting rarer and rarer, but sometimes uh, counter uh, real estate uh, is, uh, and counter area is um, critical, so they don't want to put a second screen, they just put a poll display. Very popular with convenience stores, maybe not so much with groceries. So, Poll messages, what those are, is stuff to show on the poll display. You can also display them in the point of sale screen. Uh, if you go in there, there is three messages by default, the welcome screen, the register closed, and the training message. This is what shows in English and French or Spanish uh, on your poll display. Whenever you're ready to take in transactions, you just logged on with your cashier and you're ready to scan. It says, welcome to LPAWS. You can change that to uh, welcome to My Store Inc. Uh, when you log out or close the point of sale, the poll display will display register closed. And if you go in training mode, the poll display will display training. There's also a bunch of custom messages you can set. And those can be triggered by uh, the click of a button. Um, so those can be shown on the poll display, but I can also show them uh, in the point of sale screen, either on the operator screen or the cashier screen. Let's create custom message number five, and I'm going to say uh, congratulations. Okay, so message number five, I just created it. I'm going to get out of my system settings. And we are going to go in buttons and forms. I realize we did not see that yet. We'll see it tomorrow. But I know a bunch of you guys are already familiar with that. Um, buttons and forms, any of the buttons in the list will have a setting for custom display message number. I'm going to put that one on the lottery paid out because I called that message congratulations. So I'm going to find my lottery paid out button right here. And if I go in the properties, forget about the top part for now, that's related to the lottery win function, but in the general settings at the bottom, every button in the list has these settings, the general settings. Okay, if I go on loan, general settings. If I go on uh, uh, keyboard level, general settings. I go on layaway, general settings. They're all exactly the same. But if I find my lottery paid out, <clears throat> and then general settings, I'm going to go tell it leading message number or customer message number. If you want it on the cashier screen, it's leading message. If you want it on the customer screen, it's customer message. And I'm going to tell it leading message number five for a duration of 10 seconds. Back to the point of sale, it's re-importing my changes from the back office database. I am ready to go, and my lottery win button is here. So I'm going to go a uh, few items, and then uh, $10, lottery win. 
I get my custom display message shown while well, this one is shown on the customer on the cashier screen but you guys don't see my other screen so I didn't show it on the customer monitor but I could show it on the customer monitor as well so that's one message uh, that came to mind but you can use that with any button that you press can show any button uh, any um, message that you preset in this poll messages here <laughs> So all of that can be displayed with the touch of any button. So if you have a customer screen, it shows there. If you have a poll display, it shows there as well. Um, CID limits, cash and drawer limits button. This is to give a warning to your cashiers to go make a pickup when there's too much money in the drawer. Let's say you start your day with a float of $250 in your drawer and you want to force your cashiers to go do some pickups and put money in the safe um, as soon as they reach $500 in the drawer. You don't want more than $500 in the drawer. You want them to put it in the safe when it reaches that. <coughs> Excuse me. So cash in drawer limits, press that. And by default, we only monitor the drawer cash. We can monitor any tender, but it's pretty rare that you're gonna put some uh, credit card slips on the in the safe. So by default, only cash, but you can add other tenders if you want. So if I double click on drawer cash here, uh, sorry, not double click. If I highlight it and click on amount, I can change my limit I'll put 500 and if I get out of here and go in my point of sale I'm gonna ring up uh, a bunch of sales just so I reach more than 500 in my drawer I don't know how much I have right now but let me just ring up this expensive item for 500 bucks worth when I press cash I get a money bag icon here see it so that means there's too much money in the drawer. There's more than that CID limit. You need to make a pickup. It doesn't block anything by default, but we do have the possibility of um, blocking the register after a certain amount, uh, which we will see uh, a little later. It shows in here, and it also shows in my back office. See, I have a flashing money bag icon in the back office. That means one of your cashiers have too much money in the drawer. So if you click on the money bag, you get the list of which terminal, so store 179 terminal 001, and who's logged into it. You can ask a report. Here's how much they have in the drawer. And you can also request a pickup now um, or send a message through here, file menu uh, messages. You go here, you can say, create new, uh, go do a pickup now. And then send it to this guy and send. In my point of sale, gets a message here, go do a pickup now. That means I can come here, go in my tender menu, uh, click on pickup, cash pickup. And I'm going to put, uh, uh, let's say, uh, five quantity $50 bills. Oops. Five $50 bills. I just took $250 out of my drawer and I end my cash pickup. And I just took 250 bucks from the drawer, put them in the safe. If I go take my reports in the back office now, while well, my money bag disappeared, first of all, and if I take a cashier report, for today, I can see that I had $5.99 of cash tendered, but I picked up $2.50, so in drawer is left $3.49. So that is your cash in drawer limits button. 
Uh, next tab, directories, it's all grayed out. You won't be able to touch anything in there, neither in the database. Uh, so forget about these two for now. They're, you don't really use them. If they're wrong, you can't even get them to the setup anyway. So, um, <clears throat> so forget about that. You'll never touch that. Uh, the taxes. The taxes, we, re we saw already on our items yesterday. Uh, if I go in LBOSS, maintenance items, um, we saw yesterday the tax flags, tax one, two, three, four. This is the taxability status of my item, but the rate for these flags is set up here in system taxes tab. Um, so you saw you highlight your tax, tell it whether it's a rate or a value added tax. So include it in the price or add on. If I go on tax two, I have the option to charge tax two over tax one. Not all states or provinces do that, but here in Quebec, we do do that. We have two taxes, a federal and a provincial, and then we apply the federal first, and then we apply the provincial tax over the subtotal plus the federal tax. So that is called tax on tax. That's how you set it up. Your rates are at the bottom here. If you set it to VAT, then it will be included in the price. <clears throat> I'm not sure if any of you guys use that VAT tax, but the option is available. Um, if I set one up for fun, tax three is VAT, and we're gonna say it's 9.5%. Uh, okay. Tax three, VAT, 9.5%. And tax one regular add on. I am going to go set one of my items as tax three. The gas is a popular option for that, so we're going to go with gas as tax three. And at the register, if I sell my item, $40 of gas. Tax three included. The total is still forty dollars, but it extrapolated three forty-seven of that forty dollars as tax and sent um, thirty-six uh, sixty-three as net sales and three forty-seven as taxes in my reports. So this is where you set the different tax rates. Uh, there's also a possibility of creating tax tables, uh, but I don't think any of you guys are in states that use tax tables. I think only West Virginia is left in the whole U.S. that uses tables. Uh, if you select table, you can go edit here, and there's a table set up for certain breakpoints and the amount to charge on, that, on those breakpoints. I don't think you're going to use that anyway, but it does exist. So far, so good. Um, your tax have a rate, but they also have a starting quantity. So you can say, don't charge tax under a certain amount. In Quebec, I don't think we're allowed to charge tax on anything under 25 cents, if I'm not mistaken. Um, food stamps, you all know what food stamps is. We have two types of food stamp setup, depending on what jurisdiction you're in. Uh, we call that Illinois style and New Jersey style. Uh, if you set it to Illinois style, whenever you ring up some items, it, you know, food stamps are supposed to um, uh, exempt the taxes. Well, in Illinois style, it will exempt the taxes only on the items purchased with food stamps. And if you set it to New Jersey style, as soon as you have one cent of food stamp in the transaction, all the taxes are exempted. So there's two different setups. You have to find out how it works in your jurisdiction and set it one way or the other. Food stamps, the way they work, if we go in our items in the back office, Maintenance item. Uh, let's make Oreo cookies food stampable. 
So I'm going to turn on the food stamp flag, send that to the register. Notice that the item is taxable one and two. So if I ring up that item, ah, promo item, what's wrong? Okay. So I got my item and my food stamp total is $1 because my, dollar, my item is worth $1. If I ring up the next item, that one is not food stampable, so the food stamp total does not increment. Right now, I am using Illinois style, so um, if I go $1 food stamp, it exempted the tax for $1 food stamps worth. If I would have set it to uh, New Jersey style, it would have ex exempted all the taxable items in the transaction, even the non-food stampable ones. If I try to pay with food stamps on items that are not food stampable, $2 food stamp says there is no outstanding food stamp or WIC amount in this sale. I have to ring up some food stampable items in order to be able to use food stamp. And if I go $5 of food stamp, it gives me back food stamp change. Because there was only $3 worth of food stamp usable in that transaction. And the rest was paid with cash. So that's your food stamp stuff. Uh, PLU menu. Um, those are mainly printing options for the receipt and the receipt area of the point of sale. Um, so if I turn that on, PLU number, SRP, you saved, base off SRP, I'm going to turn all of them on and just do a quick transaction. So number is there. Um, regular price is there and you saved is there and the price, the explained price is here as well. So those are all the options that I turned on. You can enable or disable some of them here in the system PLU tab. And if you want to save paper, just turn off what you don't want. So that is up to you. Um, Quantity on same line, that's for your receipt. If you scan the same item twice, do you want to consolidate them or not? Um, or have them on separate lines. Points in percentage, uh, preferred shopper points um, in your items. You have, if you recall, a point value where you can say this item gives you uh, 30 extra points, for example. Well, if I set that flag on, this will be 30% of bonus points. That's your points in percentage. <clears throat> um, the uh, gas description depending on if you're in Canada or in the US or in the Caribbean, uh, you might use gallons or you might use liters, right? So if uh, I go in the back office, show you my gas items, maintenance items by default, 101 and 102 are gas products, right? Gas PLU. So this would be the price either of a liter or a, of a gallon, depending on where you're on. And then when I sell that at the point of sale, it uses that description when it does its division. So when I go 101 item, uh, $50, it divides $50 by 1.379. But what is it? Is it a gallon or a liter? Well, it is going to use the description on uh, that setting to put next to the number it calculated.
<clears throat> the scanner definition table. I will go really briefly into it because we're going to cover it all when we see the scanner tomorrow. Uh, definition table is basically what you just punched in or scanned in, what is it? Is it a cashier card? Is it a PLU? Is it a customer account card? Uh, is it a gift card? So you basically highlight some digits. You type something and then you highlight some digits and tell it, okay, these digits here will go to price. These digits here will go to PLU. And then uh, these digits here are black, so they're going to be ignored. They don't go anywhere. And then you can put some keys, meaning some underlined numbers, to force the system to recognize, okay, if it starts with these two numbers, then it forces a match on that line rather than to keep trying the rest of the lines. I'm going really quick because we're going to see it tomorrow. But it is basically to control um, the digits of what you scan, the barcodes that you scan. Because we can scan PLUs, we can scan customer account cards, uh, we can scan gift cards, uh, cashier or manager override cards. So we have to find some kind of way to recognize what we scan, and that is with the underlying digits, and then decide what we do with the digits, uh, what function we send it to. So. I went fast, but don't worry, we'll see it in detail tomorrow. It's just to show you the existence of the definition table here, as opposed to the definition table in the scanner setup. This one is for what you punch in, and the scanner setup is what, what you scan in. It can be slightly different. <clears throat> uh, account tab. There are some print options that I'm going to turn all on, but before I can show you that, um, don't look at what I'm doing. I don't want to confuse you, but I'm going to go set up a fake text printer. Instead of a receipt printer, I want to send it to a text file. So I'm just going in peripherals and giving it a path and file name here to tell it print there. Uh, there, that'll do. So I just set myself up a fake printer. I'm going to go test it just to make sure it works. One second. Uh, this is right now. So yeah, that works. OK, let me delete this. So I'm going to run a transaction with a customer account. And I'll show you the receipt, and we'll go back in the setup and show you what's what on that receipt. So I'm going to open uh, account number one, and we're going to open uh, Peter Bohonis's account. And we're going to do a few sales and charge that to the account. So subtotal charge account. <laughs> So I just did a transaction. Let me show you the receipt real quick. So here is my receipt. And I will go back in the setup. Uh, one second. Account and uh, receipt. So here are these print options. Print account name. This is right here, the Logivision account. Print contact name. I used Peter when I got prompted for an account uh, for a, a contact. Account number that was account number one. Full address right here. Then we got our actual transaction items. Um, print account summary. That is after the transaction, it will add this part here. Account summary. Company Logivision name Peter Bahonis. Previous balance was zero. You just did a charge, and here's your new balance. So that's your account summary. Print account balance right here. You can turn that off. Some people don't like to show that. Um, actually, company accounts, they have multiple contacts for their employees, and they don't want to show how much the company owes to their employees. So you can turn that feature off. 
uh, stub receipt. Right here, it has cut the paper. You don't see it, but this is a paper cut after the trailer. And then it started off a new little chit, a new stub receipt with repeating the account summary and a signature line. So you can have the customer sign that and put that in your drawer. So that is your stub receipt. Um, account comment, I don't think this account had a comment, but it would show, I believe, uh, uh, right before the summary or inside the summary. And points balance, uh, right here. So you can enable or disable all these features on the receipt. Uh, behavior. This is for when you open an account, what happens? Get account balance. Well, I opened an account. Uh, let me get out of there and open one. Go to account number. This lady, Mary, has an account balance of 229. If that flag was off, it would so show account balance N slash A. Uh, I'm not getting it from the server. Not sure what purpose that would serve, but the option is there nonetheless. Compulsory, this will force you to enter a customer account in every transaction. So you would not put that on on a grocery environment, but sometimes you sell to specialty shops or whatever that requires your. Uh, your full pedigree. On that case, you can force an account on every transaction. You know, when you go to Radio Shack and they ask you for uh, your last five years of uh, information and uh, IRS receipts uh, just to buy a pack of batteries, and the cashier tells you, I have no choice, is the way the system is built. Well, they probably have some kind of compulsory flag on there or something. <coughs> Must be first, uh, by default, you can open accounts at any point in a transaction, but you can force it to be first. Confirmation, right now it's off. So if I open an account, let's say account number two, Mary Peterson, it opens it. If I turn the confirmation prompt on, it's gonna confirm when I open Mary's account, I go to account number, Oh, Mary Peterson, account one, two, three, four. Do you want to use this? Yes or no? So that's your confirmation prompt. Extend expiry date. Okay. Um, right here, account renewal fee is grayed out. You can't click anywhere or do anything with that. But if you turn on the accept, extend expiration date, then it becomes available and I can when I click on there I get the list of my buttons that I have in buttons and forms and the screen design there's a preset list of buttons and they all show up in here so I can get the system to press a certain button whenever an account is expired if I leave that off okay and I go to one of my accounts in the back uh, customer let's use number three now uh all ink so i'm going to take this account and make it expire there's an expiry date flag here uh field if i go in there and i make it expire uh march or let's go february 2018 that's when it expired i'll send that down and we will open this account says do you want to use this guy yes sorry this account has expired i can't open it at all but if i go here and tell it except extend expiration now if i open paul's account it says it's expired do you want to extend by one year from today so if i go yes My expiry date uh, 
after my transaction is processed is now raised to 2019 March 8th. You might want to charge some fees for that. So I'm going to go create a new PLU, a new item. I want to charge $3 whenever an account is expired. So I'm going to create a new product. Uh, Oh, one 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 one. You know what? I'm gonna use some letters. I don't want to conflict with my product, so we'll just call that one uh, renew fee. That's gonna be my PLU number, and this is gonna be account renewal fee. And I want to charge three dollars sub department whatever. So right now this is just a normal. PLU, I can scan it at the point of sale and it's going to be a normal $3 item. But that's not what I want to do with it. I'm going to go create a button in Buttons and Forms. I'm going to create a brand new button. Call that uh, Account uh, Renew. And inside that button, I'll just put a preset PLU pointing to the new item I created. I'm going fast creating that button because we're going to see it all tomorrow. So item number, I'm looking for renew fee. And if I put that button on the screen and I press it, it's simply going to ring up my account renew PLU. But that's not what I want. I'm not even going to put it on the screen. I just created it in the list, but I'm not going to put it on the screen because I want to trigger it automatically. So I'm going to go back in here, account renewal fee, I am going to point that to my button that I just created, uh, account renew right here. I'll go re-expire an account because there are, none of them are expired anymore. I'll just change that to 2017. And if I open my account now, three account number, it says, this account is expired. Do you want to extend by one year from today? We'll go yes. And it automatically triggered my account renewal fee, PLU. So from there, I can keep adding items to my transaction and pay it, or I could charge that to my account, whatever. I have the choice. <clears throat> so that is it uh, for the account renew. By the way, when I'm going in here in system or in buttons and forms or in advertisement, wherever I go, I told you I'm going to modify the back office database and it sends me back those changes when I get out. I can also access it from LBOS directly. I can go in LBOS modules menu, POS setup, and these buttons here are the same as on that drop down list. You got buttons and forms, system settings, uh, peripherals, advertisements. So if I go in system from the point of sale or if I go in system from here, it brings me the same control panel. The only difference is if I do it in LBOS, I need to send my changes back to the register. So account I can also turn on accept not found customers. Right now, if I go in here and I type a non-existing account number, I go uh, 555 account number. It just says account not found. If I go here and I say accept not found customers and create an LBOS, and I can decide what to prompt me for when I accept not found customers. So there's a prompt button here. And you can say, I, want, I don't want to prompt for all that crap. I just want the guy's name, phone number, and uh, email address. So you can enable or disable all these things. Remember, though, if you do it from LBOS, you have to go here and task deploy all changes. 
If you do it from the register, it sends you back automatically. But if you do it from LBOS, you have to run deploy all changes when you're done. Okay, now if I type 555 five, five account number, instead of just saying eh, not found, it says not found, do you want to create it? I'm gonna go yes. Enter company name. Oh, well, I'm screwed, I don't have a keyboard. Well, you always have a keyboard with LPOS, you just double tap the entry buffer zone and you get an on-screen keyboard. So you can go Alex, company name, phone number, email address, and I just created my account on the fly, and now I can start using it. And if I go in my back office now, I should have an account 555 uh, in my list of accounts in this customer table. So if I go here, 555, enter, here is my Alex account with my phone number and my email address. So that's how we create an account on the fly in the point of sale. Uh, this you will never ever touch. Uh, this probably not either. Headers. Uh, the headers tab is where you, def you define your receipt headers and uh, trailers and custom trailers, the footage. So in order for me to be able to go in there, if I try now, it's going to give me an error. Okay, I can decide what I want to edit, the receipt header, trailer, uh, additional trailers, etc. But if I go in there now, it's going to give me hey, no uh, printer loaded in your system. I have no clue how many characters you're allowed and how your driver works. So you can't go in there if you don't have a printer set up. So I'm going to cancel out of there and just go set myself up a fake printer. I don't really have one, so it's going to give me some errors, but I just need to set one up to demonstrate this. No peripherals which we'll see tomorrow, printer, let's go set up a fake TM88, good old TM88, it's giving me an error, but I don't care, so system uh, headers, receipt header, and go to configure it. And here is my receipt header. I can type in there my store address and what I need. You can highlight a line and make it bold, double wide, double high. The status always affects the whole line. You can't have a mix of two different character sets on the same line. It's a pretty basic editor, but, uh, and you also have reverse. So that's how you set up your receipt header and trailer. Header is here. Footer is there. The thank you come again and all that stuff. And you can also set some additional receipt trailers. Those do not print by default. You need to tell them to print. Trailer 3, for example. Uh, I'm going to make this, uh, I don't know, a uh, contest uh, that you can... Uh, <laughs> that you can participate. So let's go uh, name, number, and email. Keep that simple. Uh, enter our contest uh, to win big blah blah blah. So receive trailer number three, I am going to go set that in buttons and forms. Again, the general settings, any button will have that. So uh, let's say we put that, uh, if you pay with cash, you're allowed to win the drawing. If you don't pay with cash, you'd, you're not. So let's go to the cash button. And in the properties, there's some settings specific to the cache function. But if we scroll down, we have the general settings that we saw how to put the leading message number. But there's also 
uh, receipt trailer number. I can say, give me my receipt number three whenever I press cash. So if I go in here, I run a simple transaction and I hit uh, my debit card. If I show you my receipt, hold on. If I show you my receipt, I paid debit card. Oh, it's not on or what? Oh yeah, it's not printing anymore because I set up a fake printer. Hold on. Okay, sorry about that. So just a regular transaction. I hit debit or credit or check. Does that not print? <clears> hmm. <throat> me just trying to fix my receipt here it goes okay so I use my debit card I have the regular trailer if I use cash I get my trailer number two right here so you can rip that out put that in the contest and uh, but that's just an example that came to mind, the contest. But uh, some people will put their refund policies on a second trailer. Some people will put uh, some ads, you know. So it's uh, whatever you want to use it for. <clears throat> so uh, what else is left in there? Uh, Restrictors we already saw yesterday. Basically, you invent a restrictor code number. Restrictor number uh, 444. Description, uh, alcohol sales hours. And then there's two types of restrictors. Day of the week or maximum quantity. There's also no house charge and no credit card, but uh, I'll, I'll get back to that later. So day of the week, here in Quebec, you can sell beer in convenience stores and wine, but only uh, um, before 11 p.m. So you choose day of the week, you can do it day by day, or you can do Monday to Friday or all days. So I'll go all days from 11 to 7.59 is gonna be restricted, and then, um, on your items here, you can go set a restrictor code. I'm going fast because we saw it yesterday, but basically if you set the restrictor code 444 on this item and you try to scan it after 11 p.m., it's going to give you an error that you cannot sell this item at this time. You can also do it by maximum quantity. If you choose instead uh, New Deal uh, 555, if you choose maximum quantity instead, you just set a maximum and then when you assign it to the items, you're only as allowed that quantity inside a single transaction. <clears throat> so that's your restrictors uh, only a few tabs left to go before I let you guys go 
uh, the coupons. This is to be able to print coupons on your receipts. Uh, we can multiply competitors' coupons, but we'll, I won't get into that. No one does that anyway. But if you set a multiplier here, whatever amount you punch in will be doubled or crippled. Um, you can set some maximum amounts of coupons per transaction or per item. And then you can print in-store coupons. What that is, in-store coupons, is to print on your receipt printer some coupons triggered by what you buy in a transaction. So, uh, sales coupons is by amount and item coupons is by item. If I go item coupon and create a new one, it's asking me which PLU number will trigger that coupon. So I'll just take PLU number one. It's prompting me, okay, what stuff do you want to print on that coupon? Uh, let's go... Uh, this is Oreo cookie, so let's give some uh, discount on milk. Uh, get uh, 50 cent off your next milk purchase. Okay, so that would be my coupon. Pretend that it looks good. I'm not very creative. So that's the text that's going to print on the on the coupon and you can also go in the properties here and tell it in addition to that PLU number 1 I need to trigger uh either some sub departments or a total or only a certain client level uh let's say I need $20 in sub department 1 sub department if amount is equal to or greater than Twenty dollars in sub department number one. So that means that I need I need to sell PLU number one and have twenty bucks in my sub department ten in order to trigger my coupon. And the coupon prints here on the receipt printer, and I can also print it on any Windows driver uh, that you have on the computer. You can also give it a barcode. Let's say I go barcode uh, 99999 and I sell 20 bucks of grocery and my item number one. So let's sell 20 bucks plus my item number one. If I go show you the coupon now, the receipt. It printed a coupon for each of the Oreo cookies that I bought. And it doesn't show here because this is a notepad, but this is supposed to be a barcode. Okay, so I got my receipt, I got all my coupons, and the coupons have a barcode. That barcode, I can create a PLU for it in LBOS. Make this a coupon for a value of 50 cents. And if I scan that barcode, it's gonna trigger this coupon item. So that's your in-store coupons. Basically to trigger coupons for your next sale uh, based off what you purchase in the current sale. <clears throat> uh, miscellaneous tab. There's, um, there's some transaction limits you can set in there. Um, transaction limits for the last item correction, that's your void last item button. Selected correction, that's when you highlight an item and press void. Uh, refunds and negative transactions. By default, we got a gazillion dollars in there, so there's really no limit. But uh, let's say I say uh, refund, uh, maximum refund, $5. When I go in here, I'm going to try to do a refund of... Uh, this item is a dollar. Okay, so let's go refund this item. Uncle Ben's rice. It lets me. I can cash it out. No problem. This one is more expensive than five dollars. 
Okay, so if I try to refund that one, I go refund button, scan this product. It still lets me ring it up, but look, I have a flashing key icon now here. And if I try to finalize the sale, it says manager required maximum refund amount reached. So I can't refund more than five bucks without calling my manager. So the manager needs to come in here, enter his manager code, seven, manager approval. Here's my password for the rest of the transaction. And now I am able to cash it out. It's still under my account, but it got approved by this guy. So that's your refund. So you can set such a limit for, for negative transactions, any reason that makes it negative, whether it's a lot of terminal win, a lot of ticket win, or uh, bottle returns, or just refunds. So no more negative than X. And then you got some voids as well for last void and selected void. <clears throat> So it won't let you do these operations. It just won't let you finish the sale without calling your manager at the end. Uh, flip charts you might use if you sell to grocery environments. What the flip charts are, if I go use them, in the point of sale, I have a flip chart button here. When I click it, it brings a little panel over my screen and I can say, all right, give me uh, my veggies and I want to sell a uh, Crenshaw melon. Here it is. And then flip charts again, go me, give me the fruits and I want to sell a, uh, some apples. So... Flip charts is mainly for produce or any items that don't have a barcode. Uh, it's pretty popular for phone cards and stuff too, um, and gift cards uh, for you know, eBay or, or Spotify or whatever. So um, flip charts to set them up here in system, miscellaneous tab, there is a flip chart button. And then every button you see in that panel here, when you click it, it can be either a sub-department, no one uses that though, uh, a PLU, so you point it to a certain PLU number, description on the key top, and it can also be a page. So these six buttons on top, they're all pages. If I click on one of them, Fresh Fruit, you can see it's a page, and it's calling page number five. And if I right-click on it, it brings me that page five. If I click on this blank button here and I tell it, I want this to be page number uh, 99, you make up these page numbers. As long as they don't exist, it'll create them. And this is gonna be uh, phone cards. And when I click it, oh, this one's blank. I can go here and say, this is a PLU number uh, this. This is a PLU number, uh, that one. And this one is PLU number, uh, whatever. Okay. So you populate it like that. Um, these six buttons on top are always visible. These ones will vary depending on the page you're on. But you can have these bottom ones called other pages as well. So you can click this to call a page, and then this page has other sub-pages if you want. <clears throat> so that's how you create a flip chart you can also put a picture click on that and go browse to wherever you want to put your image and that's how you call your flip charts
we have a tool to populate that automatically. You give it like a category range or a PLU or number range, and it creates those pages for you. Uh, I'll try and talk about it tomorrow if we have a little bit of time left. Uh, nothing much else in there you're going to use. Uh, events. These are all pretty self-explanatory, but basically uh, to control your logout and inactivity time. So inactivity before logging off, you're uh, locking the keyboard. Uh, that means that if you lock it, only you can come back to unlock it or a manager. Kind of like a log off, you can't use the point of sale, but you have to log back on the same user. As opposed to this one here, time to force cashier log off, uh, sorry, inactivity before cashier log off, that is a complete log off, so anyone can log back in, as opposed to a lock where you have to log back in. Time of day to delete all transactions on hold. Uh, time of day to force your cashiers to sign out. A lot of people put that after midnight so that you make sure that if the guy is due to come back the next morning, uh, they don't continue working on the same shift. You have to log off and log back in. So this forces that. <laughs> auto log off after each transaction you won't do that in a grocery or a convenience store but sometimes you sell in a place that has uh, salespersons that make a uh, commission so you want to make sure that every transaction is uh, assigned to the proper salesperson so you can force them to sign on on each transaction language tab not much in there, just some little, uh, I call that the LED indicators. Uh, if I get out of there and ring up an item in my point of sale, I'll go ring up my item number one. Uh, sorry, I need to do a price inquiry on an item. So I know price inquiry here. And it shows me a little control panel here for the last product that I scan or a new one. Okay, when I scan an item, it gives me the description, the number, the price, but also uh, a little LED bar here with some indicators that light on or off, depending on the status of the item. See, this one is taxable one, taxable two. So this controls the descriptions of that LED bar. So uh, here in Quebec, for example, tax one is called GST, global sales tax. Tax two is called PST, provincial sales or product sales tax. I can't remember exactly. And there is no tax three or tax four in Quebec. So I'm going to remove them and blank them out. Uh, my store doesn't accept WIC, so I'm going to turn that off. And uh, this is scalable, SCL, and this is discountable, DSC. And if I go to another price inquiry now, well, the ones that are blank are not showing, and it changes the descriptors, the descriptors of the ones that I changed. So this item is not scalable, but it is discountable, food stampable, and GST, PST are my two taxes. You can also tell it to print both descriptions of the items. Um, maybe not in an English-Spanish environment or English-French, but uh, if you sell to Asian markets, they tend to put both the English and Chinese characters on the receipt, so you might want to print both of them. Uh, that's up to you. It affects the receipt printout and the receipt area of the point-of-sale screen. And the last place I want to show you before letting you guys go, the currency tab. This is where if your store accepts foreign currencies, this is where you go to find the, um, the exchange rates. So the exchange rates, uh, well, for us in Canada, the U.S. dollar is a foreign currency, so that's why we have it in there. Uh, let's say your store accepts uh, euros. Well, you go here, take one of the free ones, and say this is going to be a uh, euro. 
And what's the rate of a euro to a US dollar? Well, let's go look it up. Uh, uh, one euro in USD. One point twenty three. OK, so what is the rate? Let's click calculate and the foreign amount received for one dollar domestic. Actually, I needed it the other way around, didn't I? Zero point eighty one. So foreign amount received for one dollar domestic eighty one euro cents. Here's your rate. Copy it. And my store also accepts uh, Mexican pesos. So take number three, description uh, Mexican pesos. And the rate is uh, 20 pesos to a dollar. So how many foreign do you get for one dollar US? You get 20 pesos. Here is your rate. And you can add as many as you want. With that, in the buttons, there is a foreign currency button, tender eagles foreign, and in the properties of that button, this is where you go tell it, uh, oops, hold on, just got to log into the back real quick. <clears throat> so my foreign currency button I can point it to whatever currency I want to use. This is Mexican pesos, apply. Let's put that on the screen somewhere. And put, uh, let's remove $50 and put foreign dollars instead. So I go sell some items. Uh, I have 890 and I'm going to go tender menu and I'm going to pay you with uh, 50 pesos. So 50.00 pesos. Totalizers for the table has not been entered. Okay, one sec. Tender foreign, let's make that uh, US dollars instead, or euros. So I was saying, if I go sell some items and I go tender menu, I'm going to pay you with five uh, euros. It knows that five euros is worth um, is worth six seventeen US. And here's your exchange PO. I got a dollar seventeen extra. And in my reports now. Here's my foreign currency and my currency exchange PO right here, which will account for the difference between the foreign and um, what we keyed in. It says foreign currency here because I called my button foreign currency, but I could have called it euro and then created another button for pesos. Um, doesn't really change much. It's really just a description. So that's where you go set your foreign rates. And also, if you are in Canada, I'm sure this is coming to the US very soon, but Canada and Australia already did it. Uh, there's no pennies anymore. The smallest piece of money is a nickel. So this is where you would go put five cents for the smallest piece of money. And then the system will always round 
Um, will always round off to the nearest um, rounding. Oop, that didn't work. Did I set it on? Currency, five cents. So if I have a transaction of 8.37 and I go subtotal $10 cash, my change C is rounded off to 165 and I get a rounding total of two cents. So you guys in New Brunswick are gonna have to use that. And that covers today's session, guys. Uh, any questions? I know that last part was pretty heavy and uh, boring, but we had to go through it. Um, but play with it. If you have questions, don't hesitate. I will be here for another hour and a half and tomorrow morning. Otherwise, I'll be reachable next week as well. Everyone's good. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. So, uh, as I said, you got my extension 206. Don't hesitate to reach out if I can help with anything. Uh, otherwise, we are going to see each other tomorrow. We're going to see screen design and peripheral setup for scanners and printers and all that stuff. So, thank you for being there, and uh, see you guys tomorrow. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Alex. Thanks. Bye-bye.